it's my pleasure, you know, when you, there's certain privileges with being a, a chair of an um, internal committee, and that was one of mine, so for once I could get somebody that's really in my field, and I've read quite a lot of um, Professor Grant Ron's articles and have been following for a while, and he's actually, you running the six, he's running um, two units at the um, your Department of Molecular Biology and Human Genetics at uh, Stellenbosch University. And he also, at the age of 34, he already has 70 publications, which you all will agree uh, is not an easy job. And then he's also holding a peer writing, which is, I think there's only six people. Uh, you have to be below the age of 35 to get that. So I want to welcome him here. We're very proud to have him here to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Annika, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to the organizers of this event for kindly inviting me. Uh, so today, I'm just going to be given a broad overview about diagnosing TB. I'm going to talk a bit about TB and why diagnosis is so challenging. And then after chatting with Annika, I thought I would also give some uh, helpful or unhelpful uh, unsolicited advice for, for young scientists uh, who are trying to do research and possibly go into academia in South Africa. So, oh, excuse me. So on the left is the tuberculosis bacillus. It's a long rod-shaped bacilli. And on the right, we can see that when we do a stain called the acid fast stain, it has this very distinct red color. And this was the central way TB was diagnosed for hundreds of years. Uh, patients would produce a sputum. Uh, it would be examined under light micro microscopy after the stain. And if these red bacilli were seen, the patient was diagnosed as being TB positive. So TB, it's an airborne bacterial disease. Uh, we can see in this... Um, apologies, I just want to get the pointer. Uh, here we go. So we can see in this diagram, here is a patient with TB who coughs up, uh, who coughs, uh, and then from the disease part of the lung, there's the aerosolization of bacilli, and then these are typically inhaled by a susceptible contact. So TB is probably the biggest cause of death in human history. It's estimated to have killed over a billion people, vastly outnumbering all the other diseases that are listed there. And what's interesting about TB and when thinking about how to control TB is that at the beginning of the 1900s, Cape Town, which is today one of the cities, cities with the highest TB incidences in the world, had a very similar rate of TB compared to New York and London. And what you can see from this graph is in the pre-chemotherapy chemotherapy era, before streptomycin was available, um, the rates of TB in New York and London was already uh, rapidly decreasing, uh, and it was uh, not doing the same in Cape Town. And we've really seen these divergent epidemics in these very different settings. And this graph, importantly, is in HIV-negative people only. So this phenomenon appears to have occurred independently of HIV. So when we think about TB, many people think about it as an ancient disease. But this is just to give some context as to the current TB situation globally. In, the New, in New York, there was a massive outbreak of TB amongst the homeless populations and people with HIV. In London, cases have increased by 50% since 2000. In the former Soviet Union, there's the world's largest outbreak of drug-resistant TB, where over 50% of new cases are drug-resistant. And India has the world's largest TB epidemic, with an estimated incidence of 2.2 million cases. And in sub-Saharan Africa, TB kills more people living with HIV than anything else. And in fact, in South Africa, TB is the number one cause of death. And globally, it is the single biggest infectious cause of death. And this is how it ranks uh, relative to the other uh, non-communicable causes of death. So why are we still failing to control TB? Well, like any complex problem, this is a multifaceted one. We have a fundamentally poor knowledge of the underlying biological determinants of disease. 
we have very weak health systems that propagate the TB epidemic. We have continuous unmet funding needs. And finally, we have a lack of effective tools. So I'm first just going to touch on the three highlighted areas before diving deeper into the lack of effective tools. So when thinking about TB, we must remember that TB has probably been around and co-evolved with humans for as long as humans have existed. This is a fascinating study where those numbers in circles represent um, a 10,000 uh, year units. And we can see that as humans migrated out of Africa, there's genetic evidence that TB migrated with them. And different lineages of TB branched out with uh, a human migration uh, over the centuries. So as we would expect from an ancient disease that has co-evolved with humans, TB has really uh, developed lots of neat tricks for circumventing uh, control by the human immune system. Um, this is the earliest evidence of TB. It's from the pre-Neolithic period, uh, approximately 9,000 BC. And this is uh, from a skeleton that was uncovered that had TB of the spine. And you can see there are these corrosions in the spinal tissue. Uh, and this is this form of spinal TB is still something that we see today, mostly in patients with advanced immunosuppression. So I'm going to just show you a video, which is an example of one of the biological tricks that TB has evolved. And if you look at the, the red dots, these are the TB bacilli. And these uh, cells in the highlighted in these different colors are alveolar macrophages. So these are one of the early lines of defense against TB infection. And what we'll see if we watch the video is if you watch the green macrophage, you can see it eats up the TB. But then the TB replicates that green macrophage subsequently dies and gets consumed by the yellow macrophage. That then also dies, and subsequently the pink macrophage does the same thing. It eats the dead yellow macrophage, and there's this cascade of immune cell death. And what the net result of this is that you get uh, the body forming these structures called granulomas, where the TB disease is, con is contained. But that granuloma can become caseous, where the TB replicates continuously within that environment, and eventually the bacilli spill out. And that typically leads to very active, severe forms of disease. And this is the net result of it. You get uh, TB that's disseminated throughout the lungs. You get holes in the lungs. And this is how patients ultimately die. So in terms of weak health systems, uh, this is a recent exercise that we did in collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this is something called a care cascade where we just look at the volume of patients from the point of initial presentation to the clinic to eventual cure. And what we can see is that depending on whose estimate you believe, there's somewhere between half a million to 600,000 TB cases in South Africa every year. 86% of those are successfully tested. Of those 86%, 17% are lost because we don't have perfect diagnostics. Of those that are diagnosed, 13% are lost because even though we know they have a positive result, they're not started on treatment for all kinds of reasons. Either the patient doesn't come back to the clinic, the clinic doesn't have drugs. And then of those patients who are started on treatment, 27% uh, are not successfully treated. So the end result of this is that every year, we are only successfully curing 45% of the TB burden. So how can we ever defeat TB if we're only curing half of the people who get it every year? So the TB epidemic globally is concentrated in six countries, one of which is South Africa, and access to care remains a major problem. It's estimated that 10 million people need access to care for TB, and only 6 million got it. And critically, drug resistance, which I'm not going to talk about in this lecture, is a huge rising problem, because even though it affects a minority of patients, these patients disproportionately consume a huge amount of resources that strain the healthcare system. So only one in five people who have drug-resistant TB actually get the treatment that they require. And only half of those people who start treatment for drug-resistant TB are ever cured. So funding, this is uh, the global targets to end TB by 2030. And these goals are to achieve a 90% reduction in TB deaths and an 80% reduction in TB cases compared to 2015. And if you look at the blue columns, those are the levels of funding in each category that are required in order to achieve those goals. And the red columns are where we are at currently. 
So we are drastically underfunded. And what is even crazier about this is that economists have modeled what is the return on investment if we invest in TB research and TB control. And for every dollar we spend, it's expected that by 2030, uh, we will get an 85-fold return on investment. Uh, I mean, that's a crazy return on investment. I'm sure if your bank manager proposed something like that to you, you would think it's a scheme of some sort. So focusing on, on the lack of effective tools, these really fall into three different categories, drugs and vaccines and then diagnostics. I'm going to give a slide or two about drugs and vaccines. So look at all these pills. On the left, this is a number of pills, including the two, the two towers on the right, which are injections, that are needed to cure a patient, one patient, with MDR-TB. It's 14,600 pills. It's two years of antibiotic treatment, right? Higher than the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's, no, it's really no surprise that there are such challenges, not only with adherence, but also with side effects. The pill burden in TB is a massive, massive problem. It's probably the infectious disease with the biggest burden of antibiotics that is required to cure it. In terms of vaccines, this has been an area of spectacular failure in recent years. And lots of studies have been done. They've been very unsuccessful. And unfortunately, funders have become really, really adverse to funding new TB vaccine studies. There's been an approach to go back to basics. The current vaccine we use it only partially works in children where it prevents very uh, severe disseminated forms of the disease. And there was a, a huge, uh, impressive study that was led by UCT that was published in 2013, which essentially failed. And if you look at this graph, this is a modeling exercise, which really shows that if we have a dual action vaccine that A, protects you from uh, being infected, but then also prevents that infection from progressing to active disease, we can really expect to have a massive impact on the future incidence of TB. So in terms of diagnostics, I, I like this poster because it's, it's 60 years old, but most of the techniques that are featured in it were until recently used every day. We can see things in there like microscopy, x-ray, and uh, immunological skin tests. But in the last five years or so, there's really been unprecedented innovation in the TB diagnostics uh, space. So one of the reasons diagnosis is so important is that we know in South Africa that if you go into a hospital and you look for TB, you will probably find it. These are just two samplings of studies where they looked at cadavers in people who had died, and in over half of them, they found undiagnosed TB. So TB is everywhere we look. And one of the reasons it's so difficult to diagnose TB is that traditionally widely used tests like microscopy are not sensitive. This laboratory pictured in the bottom right here, this is from a flagship uh, tertiary hospital in India, and those are the conditions. The laboratory conditions are extremely poor. And actually in this hospital, um, the windows are all shut, even though it's India, uh, and it's completely sweltering inside and there's no infection control. Uh, and the reason the windows are shut is because otherwise the monkeys come and uh, steal um, the equipment. So really what we need are simpler tests that can be done close to the point of care. Another reason it's so difficult to diagnose TB is that TB grows really slowly. It takes six to eight weeks to culture. And what's important is that even though nowadays we have these automated culture systems which are used routinely in South Africa, culture, because it takes so long, is really not useful for clinical decision making in real time. And it's especially uh, not useful for extrapulmonary forms of TB. So about 20% of patients can get TB outside of the lungs. And on average, it takes uh, 20 days for a culture from an extrapulmonary specimen to become positive. So this is a TB diagnostic pipeline, which really, if you look at the vertical axis, shows the complexity of tests. And on the horizontal axis, we look at the uh, closeness of these different tests to being ready for use. And what I just want to note is that this is where Gene Expert, which is a new test that I will talk about further, falls. But we want to be in the bottom right corner, where we have tests that are very simple and are close to implementation. And you can see that other than one or two items listed here, yeah, this is generally a blank space. So there's really a need for more innovation in the TB diagnostics area.
when we model the impact of potential TB diagnostics, if we just continue with what used to be the status quo, which is using microscopy, we're not really going to impact incidence. If we do PCR-based testing at centralized laboratories, which is happening now with GeneXpert, we're going to significantly reduce the incidence of TB, but that's going to plateau. It's, not, it's still not going to be low enough. If we have a point-of-care dipstick test, where we can have same-day clinical decision-making at the patient bedside, there we can really expect to have the largest impact on the incidence of TB. So this brings me to a technology called GeneXpert. And I don't know if many of you, if any of you remember, but around the turn of the century in the 2000s, there were a series of anthrax attacks in the US where people were sending envelopes full of white powder to politicians they didn't like. Um, and this is a, a, a reward poster that was put out by um, the, I think it was the FBI at the time before the Department of Homeland Security existed. But this created a lot of panic. Um, even though the scale of these attacks was not very large. And one of the ways this panic was dealt with is that a technology was spun out of the U.S. Department of Defense, which was installed in post offices. And it was made by a company called Cepheid, and it was an automated platform to detect anthrax, where envelopes would be put in a cartridge, automatically processed, and a PCR was done. So one of the few things to maybe come out of the war on terror that's good is that this technology subsequently formed the basis for gene expert and in 2011 uh, our health minister called it a bazooka to help fight the war on tb um, and in that at that time he was one of the first health ministers in the world uh, to make the decision to roll out this technology uh, for it to become the new standard of care and at the time that was a very controversial decision so this is uh, how GeneXpert works. It's just a PCR-based test, and how it works is that it detects TB by targeting a gene that also indicates if there's resistance to rifampicin, which is one of the key drugs used to treat TB, and it has a series of overlapping probes. And if there is amplification, TB is present, but if one of those probes fails to amplify, the test assumes that that's due to the presence of a mutation that blocked the probe from binding. Expert is really simple. Uh, it's a fantastic example of a sophisticated molecular biology technology that's been automated and simplified. We've done studies where we've taken someone with really a minimal education, given them one day of training, and they've done expert at an equivalent standard to a PhD level clinician at a centralized laboratory. How expert works is that buffer is added to sputum, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's shaken, uh, it's incubated for 15 minutes. That buffer liquefies the sputum, and importantly, it renders it non-infectious. And then that's put in the cartridge, and the cartridge goes into the machine. You come back two hours later, and you have a result uh, that says TB, yes, no, and if there's TB, whether or not there's rifampicin resistance. However, gene, gene experts are expensive. A four-module machine is almost $20,000. It's not portable. It cannot be done at the point of care, and it needs a continuous power supply. So this video from the manufacturer so shows the design of the gene expert cartridge. And really, it's a single-use disposable cartridge that has multiple chambers. And how it works is that when it's put into the machine, um, there's this central uh, column in the middle. And in each of the, each of the chambers are the PCR reagents. So yeah, the person is adding the liquefied sputum to the cartridge. The cartridge is subsequently inserted into the machine. And then what happens is that a plunger comes down, and that mixes in a certain sequence the specimen with all the different phases of chemical reactions that are required with the PCR. And this is really where the key innovation comes in, is that the automated DNA extraction. So the TB bacilli are passed through the base of the machine, and everything that's extracellular is supposedly uh, passes through a membrane, and the bacilli are trapped on that membrane on the bottom. Uh, then there's a series of washing steps that happen, which allow the bacilli to be clean, um, and this is the washing happening now. And once the washing is done, there's actually a sonication horn in the base of the machine, which uses sound waves to rupture the bacilli.
that frees the DNA and allows the DNA to pass through the membrane. Um, so this automated sample preparation is really a key advantage. That's far more important than the molecular biology that happens. So now the DNA is purified and it is placed in this uh, diamond-shaped chamber that sticks out at the back of the cartridge. And that is a, a very transparent piece of plastic because what happens is we're going to do real-time PCR where we monitor fluorescence using six different colors of lasers. And that allows us to quantify the amount of DNA that's in the chamber. So you can see that happening now. The purified DNA is in that chamber and the accumulation of fluorescence is monitored. And that's what gives you your readout. So since 2011, or GeneXpert has been massively scaled up. Um, this data earning goes up until 2016, but over 25 million cartridges uh, have been used. There are over 25,000 machines. And South Africa is by far the biggest consumer of GeneXpert. I want to quickly give you an example about a study that we did which showed that high diagnostic accuracy does not necessarily translate into clinical usefulness or clinical utility. This was a study that we did at, uh, in four countries across southern Africa. It was a randomized controlled trial. And what we see here is the proportion of patients diagnosed with time. And patients received either microscopy or expert. And you can see that expert detected very rapidly almost 50% more patients than microscopy did. So that's great, right? A 50% increase. But then when you look at the proportion of TB cases in each arm who actually successfully started treatment, you will see that this gap between the red line and the blue line is much smaller than the gap it is in the previous graph. And that's essentially because even though expert diagnosed more cases in the standard of care, there were only small cases, small increases in the amount of cases on treatment. And in fact, when we looked at long-term mortality and morbidity benefits in patients who received expert, we did not find any benefit compared to the smear microscopy standard of care. And really what the net effect of expert was, was that it actually displaced what we call empirical clinical decision making that had been happening uh, in the presence of this really poor performance by smear microscopy. So this just shows how diagnostic accuracy is not always everything. And when you place a new technology into a healthcare system, you can't expect that one technology to solve all of your problems. Um, this is a slide I primarily included for Annika, uh, which just shows how when you have a used expert cartridge, something that would ordinarily be thrown away, work by two of my students showed that you can actually just take a normal insulin syringe, you can pull out the leftover TB genomic DNA that's in that diamond, and you can use that to very accurately do uh, further drug susceptibility testing. Uh, and this just shows the technical details of that. And really the advantage of that is that you can go from one specimen to having a TB diagnosis, an MDR diagnosis, and even an XDR diagnosis. So th the fact that patients need to return to the clinic to give multiple specimens is a major problem because many patients don't do it, they don't have the resources to do it, and many clinics forget to recall them, and it leads to diagnostic delay. So this is one small way of maybe minimizing that problem. I want to talk about a project a student of mine called Brigitte did, and what she did is she looked at labs who do a very common test for drug resistance uh, called the MTB uh, DR plus test. And what she actually found incredibly is that many of those labs, including most of the labs in Europe, were actually doing this test wrong. And it's a PCR based test. And she noticed that in specimens that were smear negative, so specimens that had few bugs, the test was failing far more than it ought to do. And when she troubleshooted it, she found that there was a very obscure setting on the PCR machine, which was incorrect. And that uh, requirement for that setting was really hidden in a manual. It was on page 201 in a footnote, and no one ever read it. So we wondered if other people besides us had been making this mistake. And in fact, only 16% of the over 200 laboratories worldwide that we surveyed were using the correct ramp rate. The vast majority were using a whole bunch of incorrect ramp rates. And what the net effect of this is, is that basically by correcting the ramp rate, 
you can increase the number of possible MDR diagnoses by 20%. Um, and in the respondents alone, this would result in at least 100 more people with MDR-TB being diagnosed every month uh, compared to when they were using the incorrect ramp rate setting. So a new uh, version of Expert has just been launched to much fanfare. It's called Ultra. Um, this graph shows the limit of detection of Expert. The manufacturer claims that it detects about 110 bugs per mil, and it, the manufacturer also claims that Ultra detects uh, about tenfold less, so about 15 bugs per mil. And one of the key advantages of Ultra is that they've changed the target of the PCR. So it no longer goes after a target which each bug has only once on the genome. It goes after a target where the bug has between 1 and 30 copies of it on the genome. So there's just more opportunity and more targets available for the assay to detect TB. Uh, they also made some other technical uh, variations such as larger reaction volumes and improved microfluidics. But where they are really smart is that this does not require a new machine. So it's a very attractive prospect to people who've already invested in the previous technology. Uh, I just want to talk briefly about some of Byron's research, who's a postdoc in my group. He's been looking at how Ultra works in people who are newly diagnosed with HIV, so they haven't started antiretroviral therapy, and they're completely asymptomatic. We find that almost 20% of them have active TB in Cape Town. And uh, he showed that of those that were sputum culture positive, Ultra detected about two thirds of them. What's interesting though, is that he also did Ultra on the urine of these patients. And you can see that Ultra is detecting a small number of patients that are missed by sputum based diagnostics. He also did this novel test called a LAM test. And you can see that the LAM test, which is done in the urine, detected the same people who were detected by the sputum based test. So um, this is Radesh, who's a, a, a very uh, inventive postdoc of mine uh, from India. And he uh, is working on ways of diagnosing super spreaders. Super spreaders are individuals who are disproportionately responsible for the majority of transmission. And if we know what a super spreader looks like, we can find them and really cut down on TB transmission. But we don't know what makes someone a super spreader. So uh, he built this chamber, this box, where we are quantifying and measuring uh, TB in the aerosol, not the sputum, but the aerosol of patients. Uh, because we must remember that it's TB and aerosol that infects people. It's not TB and sputum that infects people. And this is an area that's really neglected in terms of TB research. Um, another uh, uh, team in my group are looking at uh, TB and the microbiome. And what's incredible about TB is we know from animal studies, if you expose mice to TB, even though TB is a lung disease, the gut microbiome of those mice changes drastically within six days. And there's no TB present in the gut, right? So this really speaks to the ability of TB to manipulate the host immune system and how there's this immunological crosstalk between the lungs and the gut. And what Carissa and Georgina did is that they showed that in pre-treatment patients, so TB cases before they've been on treatment, compared to sick controls, they are enriched in certain bacterial taxa. And these bacterial taxa are known to promote inflammation. They're known to make short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate. And what's interesting about butyrate is that we know if we add it to alveolar macrophages, it really suppresses the ability of those alveolar macrophages to kill TB. So this is a very early uh, project, early phase, but very intriguing. Uh, and how TB uh, and the microbiome are affected when treatment is started, which involves thousands of doses of broad-spectrum antibiotics, who knows what happens? And that's one of the research questions we are looking at. So in summary, I'm going to give you a TB diagnostics wish list. We easily get distracted by fancy new technology, but the reality is we don't use our current tools well enough. Um, we have tools that we have scientifically proven to be diagnostically useful, but they are not widely implemented. We urgently need a rapid non-sputum triage biomarker test, which can be used in the community. We need to accept the premise that a shiny new technology is not going to fix what is probably a complex societal health systems problem. We need to think more about how we can incorporate patients' preferences into diagnostic algorithms. And we need interconnected systems that address comorbidities 
like HIV, diabetes, and depression, which often are synergistic with the TB epidemic. We need empowered patient and community TB champions. And finally, we just need realistic funding to achieve the goals that have been outlined. So uh, shifting gears somewhat, um, I, I don't know if this will be useful to you. These are some lessons that I've learned recently. Um, I, I thought it might be useful to the young scientists, uh, especially in a South African situation. Um, one piece of advice, advice would be to focus on a big or important problem. In South Africa, you need to play to your local strengths, right? If you're working on a pure basic science project, it's very hard to compete with a large lab in Europe or the US where they have a giant team of postdocs and many, many funds. You need to uh, use South Africa's unique combination of having a massive disease, disease burden and simultaneously having very high quality, world-class medical research infrastructure. And the one thing I learned from moving into TB is that it allows you to access two different funding streams. It's at the interface of disciplines. You can tap into basic science research, you can tap into clinical and medical research money. And then it just, that just increases the pool of funding that's available to you by orders of magnitude. I suggest that you apply to anything and everything that you meet the eligibility criteria for. Even if you think you don't know much about it, I can guarantee you the quickest way to learn about a topic is to try to write a funding application on it in a few weeks or even a few days. Um, using industry to supplement research funding is really critical to tide you over during tough times. And importantly, learn that rejection in research is common, but it's not without value if you learn something for, from it. Uh, one statement that I like is remember that the master has failed more times than the student has tried. And also, when looking at other scientists in your field, don't compare yourself to someone else's highlight reel. You're only seeing the highlights of their work. You haven't seen all the pitfalls and mistakes that they've made. And remember that there's no dishonor in getting a job outside academia. Academics have fantastic, broadly applicable skills that are more relevant than you think, and many people find this path fulfilling. I would really recommend also that you ask senior people explicitly if they are willing to be a mentor to you and work hard at maintaining a reciprocal relationship with them, and also take time to learn the soft skills to mentor and manage other people. You cannot ever do everything yourself. And many funders or institutions' rules are soft. It never hurts to ask for an exception and if that can be motivated for. There are many times I've submitted something late when I've been granted an exception and it's, ruled up, it's turned out to be successful. Also, be generous with your ideas and your time. If you have an idea, but you don't have the capacity to do it yourself, it's better to give that idea to someone else and collaborate with them in doing it. The biggest limiting factor is not your capacity for ideas. It's just your time and what you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Finally, remember that the biggest impact you will make in your career is as a result of the people you yourself will train and mentor. And keep things in perspective. The average man on the street doesn't care about cell, nature, Lancet, NEJM. They don't even know what they are. And finally, remember to have fun and know when to take time off. And thank you. And thank you to Annika for inviting me.